Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good too. So first of all, thank you so much for being here, for accepting my request. I have been receiving a lot of messages uh, about medicine studies in Italy, and I literally had no idea about them. And I was struggling to answer. All I knew was, yes, you have to give an IMAT and all that. So I came across your channel and I thought, so yes, I have someone from whom I can <laughs> ask. So Thank I you. dropped a message and you were one of the very rare ones who replied. <laughs> and most oh, importantly, <laughs> I see. And most importantly, you agreed to do this. So thank you so much. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Like, I'm so happy to help out. And it's really nice to work with someone who also wants to help students, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for Edward. So yes, first of all, I think you should introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a fifth year medical student in Sapienza's English program. So I started five years ago when medicine in Italy wasn't really a well-known subject, but now it's like exploding in popularity. So I've like created a website and a YouTube channel and I give information about like two students, especially international students who want to study medicine in English in Italy. And I'm in La Sapienza, which is located in Rome. Yeah, of course. So that's amazing. Uh, medicine in English, that too in Rome, that is quite something, of course. So, yeah, can you uh, tell me about your journey that how you got it, got admission in Sapienza and what was the process like in a general way? Sure. So the first thing to know is that the admission process changes depending on if you're an EU candidate or you're a non-EU candidate. So if you're from an EU country, basically in June, you just pay for the exam. And then in September, you do the exam. And in October, you just... Uh, enroll into the university if you get an offer. If you're a non-EU student, however, the process is a bit more complicated, where around April time, the Ministry of Education in Italy will release what's called a call to applicants. And after this, students need to go to their embassy and fill out something called a Form A and do something called the yeah. pre-enrollment. Yeah, like uh, I think uh, the rest of the process is quite the same because we also... Yeah. Uh, pre-enroll and then uh, fill the form in and all that so uh, and uh, what is the is there any other difference between EU candidates and non-EU because uh, yeah the, the most of the sorry. audience will be non-EU who will be watching this so I I would like you to emphasize more on non-EU Sure, no problem at all. Thank you. So non-EU students need to be very, very careful with uh, what university they apply to because essentially they only have one chance. At the moment, there's 19 universities in Italy that offers medicine in English. Four of them are private and 15 of them are public. So if you're EU, you're able to apply to all of them. But as a non-EU student, you can only apply to one single university. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important that you make your choice uh like well, because the problem is if you don't score highly enough for your first choice university, you can't get into any of them. Mm -hmm. So like I say this would, I think in my opinion, this is the most important difference between non-EU and EU students, not the application process, but basically, yeah, just choosing one university is the main difference. Okay, okay, that is quite a big difference, but yeah, it is what it is. So uh, can you know, I know that the most important hurdle uh, is IMAT. I'm calling it right. So basically, you call yeah, it yeah, IMAT? but yeah, it's the IMAT, uh, but the IMAT is actually the only hurdle because Italy is very unique in that it doesn't actually care about your high school grades. So in a lot of other countries, uh, your high school grades might be taken into account. You might need to do an interview of some sort to get admission. But here in Italy, all they care about is your final IMAT score. And basically at the end, uh, once you sit the IMAT, which is a 90 minute exam, uh, sorry, a hundred minute exam out of 90 points with 60 questions. Once you sit this exam and your results come out, you're placed into a ranking for your first choice university. And if you're in the top of the ranking, you get in. And if you're not, then you don't get in. So the only thing that matters is your IMAT score. That's it, nothing else. Okay, so you now you have made it crystal clear that it's all IMAT. So now you will have to suggest them, uh, give some advices to the students that how should they prepare themselves for IMAT. 
Sure. So essentially, the IMAT is a multiple choice question exam. So I would say that uh, kind of studying strategies as well, like I'm going to go on to the content, but I think at core, you have to understand how to work with a time limit and how to make strategic guesses, because in the IMAT, you get a negative marking if you answer incorrectly. So it's not a type of test where if you're not sure, you can just guess an answer. So the first thing that students need to understand that this is not something that you want to leave down to luck, and you actually want to start like strategizing very early on, uh, practicing with timings and knowing what the probability is if you can eliminate an answer before you answer the question. When it comes to the actual content of the IMAT, uh, so there's 22 questions in the first section, 10 for logical reasoning and 12 for general knowledge. For logical reasoning, you can kind of improve on this. There are like really good books, uh, Cambridge A-level books, which I'll put as a comment once you release this video. But so you can study logical reasoning from the books by practicing questions, you know, critical reading, understanding what the question stems are and what are they asking from you. General knowledge is unfortunately not something that you can really study for. There are topics they like to repeat, which is generally European history and parliament and politics. So you can kind of study for that, but general knowledge is unfortunately not something that you can, you know, just go and cram. So, uh, the next, yeah. But, uh, if you like do very poorly in general knowledge and uh, <laughs> like uh, there are only 10 questions of general knowledge. Well, general knowledge questions. So like, uh, as you said that it is not uh, almost possible to prepare very well for general knowledge. So if someone because most of non-EUs don't have information about European Parliament. Will you suggest them to study it in detail or they can just uh, leave general knowledge on luck or on guesses? I mean, it really depends on how much time you have left. Like at the moment, you if you like release this video in a week, then people have one year to prepare for next year's exam. Mm -hmm. And in one year, like sure, you might not be able to study general knowledge, but you don't really have an excuse to watch a few documentaries on like World War II or, you know, read a few Wikipedia pages on NATO and the UN. And sure, like this might not come up and I wouldn't go and like create flashcards to learn this and cram for it. But really in a year, like you have no excuse to really improve your general knowledge about the world anyway. And also the thing to consider is that like on this year's paper, they asked a lot about like uh, Russian uh, like literature and, you know, Russia, sure, like a part of it is kind of in Europe, but I wouldn't consider it anything to do with like European history or politics. So like I if you don't have that much time, though, I would not waste time on it. Like I would try to maximize my score in other areas. But if you have a year you don't really have an excuse to get like a little bit more knowledgeable about how things work in the continent you're going to move to for six years. I mean, there's also that to consider, like if you get in, you're going to move to Europe and, you know, it would be nice if you also understood things about Europe before you came here. So it really depends on the amount of time you have. So uh, met, uh, I met occurs once a year. Yes, in, in September. June, in June, July, I think if we have one year. So in June, July, you pay for the exam, but the exam is in the second week of September. So it actually only happened last week. Okay, okay. Yeah, I saw your Instagram stories. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, now we should come to the most important part, the medicine related questions. Okay, like so I wouldn't say they're medicine related, but after the 22 questions of general knowledge and logical reasoning, you have 18 questions on biology, you have 12 questions on chemistry, and you have eight questions on maths and physics. So biology is obviously, they say it's to the level of like A levels for Cambridge, but we've seen a trend in the last years that the questions are increasing in difficulty. So I would say that like saying that it's at a high school level would be a little bit unfair because the questions are actually getting trickier and trickier. So there will be uh, 18 questions, biology, which is obviously the like the biggest part. So that would probably be the part that students should focus the most on, followed by 12 in chemistry and then eight the eighth maths and physics is usually split like you don't really it's never four and four like it might be two maths six physics it might be four math uh, four physics but they're generally clumped together so this is like kind of like the format of the entire test okay, so uh, as you told that they are not at the same level as high school so students apply for the studies after high school so what would you suggest them to study as an extra for the IMAT? I wouldn't say an extra, but I would say that like you need to make sure that uh, 
So I don't know if you know how the UK system works, but basically A levels is also like a slightly higher than just basic high school. So I would say like being familiar with A levels and IB, like knowing their books, looking at previous questions. And, you know, if you are noticing a gap, like going to Wikipedia and YouTube and using that to like bridge the gap is really the best thing that uh, you can do. Because honestly, like on paper, in theory, the paper is the exam is designed for people straight out of high school. Now they're making it trickier because obviously the competition is increasing, but like on the flip side, it's increasing for everyone. So it's not that the paper is starting to favor people who are already outside of high school. They're just, you know, favoring people who really learned that material really well and understand it conceptually. So like memorizing facts about biology isn't going to help you. You need to like deeply understand the concepts to be able to apply what you know to the questions. So I would say that like, if you're in high school right now, like you should really, really start doing uh, BMAT, IMAT, like IB, A-level papers, go through the books, you know, um, just try to, I wouldn't say learn as detailed as you can, but as deeply as you can. The thing to consider is that the exam is for Italy, but it's actually prepared and administered by Cambridge. And, you know, like Cambridge also does the A-levels and they do their own books for the A-levels and they design the IMAT exam, of course, based on the specifications that the Ministry of Education in Italy sets. But if you like if I had to take a gamble on which books would be the best, it would be the Cambridge A-level books just because they design the test itself. So it's definitely something that like if you really want to give yourself a chance, you should know those books inside out, in my opinion. No, at the end. I would, uh, I would want you to imagine yourself at the same stage again, at the stage when you were applying and you were hoping to get a position here and your that mindset and the things you learned on the way. In light of the, all these things, you what would you like to advise the students at that stage, like who are willing to study medicine somewhere in the world? So you mean what like what would I do differently or what would my advice be to what, what, me before uh, I started? What would be your advice? Your advice, like an ultimate advice. <laughs> okay. My ultimate, ultimate, ultimate advice is to make your first choice based on the city and not the university. Because I see this over and over again. And I fell into this trap that before I got in, I thought that university rankings mattered. I thought that the prestige of the university mattered. I thought like, oh, but this one, you know, it's, it looks better. Look, all these online websites are saying that this university is better. And I can tell you as someone who's like helped thousands of students, who's about to graduate and know how postgraduate things work is that the ranking of the university doesn't really matter. All of them are going to be up to a certain standard. So there is no point in you putting a university that is going to be too competitive for you to get in, in a city you're not going to even enjoy. And like a lot of students don't want to listen to this. They, I think like they just want to think that they're in a really good university, but the truth is all of the universities are good. Like to get accreditation in Italy, they have to be up to a certain standard. And so I would really, really suggest students to make their first choice based on the city that they like. And they think that they're going to like blend in well and not care about, oh, but this university is like one point higher in this one ranking that no one uses and no one cares about because, you know, like, rankings don't really matter. So I think that's like, if I could beat one message into uh, students' heads, it would be to make your decision based on the city and not the university itself. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. This is what I have also realized after coming here. Exactly on the same page. <laughs> so well. yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. No problem. Is that is that it, all you were going it, to ask it me? It meant a lot, and I know it. Oh, okay. It, it will be meaning a lot to everyone who have who have just uh, finished watching this. So, okay then. I think you explained no problem, everything Lord. in detail, and uh, I will share your website link uh, in the description and uh, in the pinned comment. And I suggest everyone who is watching this to go and check out her website. She's doing just an amazing Thank you. <laughs> big fan here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, then, Sarah. Bye-bye.